Golden Vale Homestead, which was originally called Golden Valley, but it's a National Trust property. It's a fairly recent property within the National Trust portfolio. And it was gifted to the Trust by the Honourable Geoffrey Keithley, OAM, and his wife, Mrs. Karen Keithley, in 2005. Now this picture was taken on the 27th of May 2005, just a few weeks before Geoffrey's death, when he was presented with life membership of the National Trust at Golden Vale. And also in the picture, so um, there's Geoffrey, and that's Barry O'Keefe, who was the president of the National Trust of Australia at the time. What's remarkable to me is that the properties remained in the hands of just five families over the past 150 years. It is a special place, it's on the New South Wales State Heritage Register. To the left is the road down to Sutton Forest, to the right is up to the Hume Highway, Golden Vale's about halfway in between, and it's on the banks of the, the Medway River there. So it is a pretty special setting. It's easy to understand why back in the, the 1800s and the early 19th century that this was such a popular summer holiday destination for the rich. So New South Wales Governor's House at Hillview, which was just down the road at Sutton Forest. Also down the road were the big colonial properties, Newbury and Oldbury. And when the governor came down, the entourage from Sydney followed. So it, it was a nice, idyllic summer lifestyle. They, they would have hunts, they would have balls, and possibly reflecting the upper class lifestyle that many would have left behind in England. So, Golden Vale's a great place to come. It's right there in the centre, and it's this beautiful Georgian sandstone building and around 200 acres today. The pre-European settlement, the Gundungara people, as we know, inhabited the Southern Highlands land for many thousands of years. The Winch Caribbean, Wallandilly rivers were the focus of their lives and their ancient dreaming stories. They were largely undisturbed until the European settlement, when Europeans came through in 1817, which ultimately led to the loss of their land. The first Europeans to live at Golden Vale were the Hogan family in 1825 after a land grant was promised to Michael Hogan. Michael, his wife and child, assisted by um, two assigned convicts, lived on the land for five years and sold out to ex-convict Thomas Wilmot in 1830. Hogan never got his formal land grant, which was eventually granted to Thomas Wilmot in 1842. Unlike many of the subsequent owners, Michael Hogan was actually an Aussie. He was born in the colony in 1804, the son of Irish convicts, and relatively young when he started his settlement of the land. By the time the Hogan sold out to Thomas Wilmot in 1830, the Hogan family had in fact developed a bit of a reputation. In a report by the Commissioner for Crown Lands in 1838 on the district squatters, it was noted, the Hogans have been notorious in the colony as harbourers of bushrangers and cattle stealers. Bit of a reputation then he sold to Thomas Wilmot, the next owner who was there for 27 years, who eventually sold out to Edward Carter, in 1857. This is uh, one of the few pictures we have of 
Edward Carter, it's courtesy of John Carter, who's um, one of his great grandsons. And Edward Carter arrived in the colony in, um, he was aged 11, with his parents and two sisters in 1833. He married Mary Ann, his wife, in 1856 in St. Andrew's Church, Sydney. Now it's Edward Carter who's significant to us because he built the house that's there today. The family first lived in a small brick house, no longer to be seen, but we think that further beyond the house, down more towards the river. And that's an area which is prone to flooding, so it may well be why they, they built it a bit further back. And he built the house, his wife and growing family, so he ended up with eight children. And also significant about Edward is that he discovered kerosene shale in the Joanja Valley and began mining it in 1873. The kangaroo hunt, which was uh, reported in a newspaper in 1871, which tells about the kangaroo hunt, a tradition at Golden Vale, and it, I quote, 32 huntsmen, 44 dogs, 48 horses killed, a grand total of 76 kangaroos and 15 joeys in two and a half days. So the property remained in the Carter family for several years and was run as a, run as a sheep, cattle and horse breeding enterprise. Edward died in 1903, leaving Golden Vale to his second son, Alfred Carter. And when Alfred died in 1922, the property passed to Edward's grandson, Walter. So Walter inherited everything. This is a rather lovely picture, especially for us in Bundanoon, because it's, it's Golden Vale in 1888. And we can see there, Edward Carter with his horse in front of Golden Vale. But what's special about the picture is it was taken by Gus Nicholas. In 1938, the Carters sold Golden, Golden Valley to Sir Philip Goldfinch, who lived there till he died in 1943. Until Goldfinch, the Golden Valley property had remained largely unchanged and one suspects that Goldfinch had much more permanent plans beyond his five years when he moved in and started making the first set of alterations. Sir Philip was a, a prominent Australian politician and he had a fairly impressive colonial pedigree. Born in England but the great great grandson of the third governor of New South Wales the great-grandson of Admiral Philip Parker King, and just for good measure on the maternal side, he was also a descendant of the MacArthur's at that time. Moving on through the owners, this is actually a picture of, of Geoffrey, the final owner, at Eton with his mum and dad. Notice also that one of his teammates there with that lovely sort of cricket laser Frank Keithley bought the property in 1943 from the Goldfinch estate and he continued to farm the land until 1965. When he died, he bequeathed the property to his wife Mabel for her lifetime and then to his nephew Geoffrey. Nephew Geoffrey managed the whole of the property until Mabel's death in 1976 and then he inherited the lot. Geoffrey and his wife Karen didn't actually permanently move into Golden Vale until the 80s and I think they were a bit undecided about whether they were going to live there or not. But the longer they had it, the more it grew on Karen. And in the 80s, they moved in permanently and they set about restoring the house and changing the garden. Geoffrey Keithley was the one who changed the name um, to Golden Vale. And he was also responsible in 1999 for getting the place state heritage listed. 
and at that time it was 560 hectares and still runs the cattle enterprise with some sheep. It remains in the Keithley family right up until 2005 when Geoffrey and Karen gifted the property to the National Trust of Australia. Two story, beautiful sandstone house. Sandstone possibly from Bondanoon. It looks the same colour as what we've got down the road, but it's never ever been confirmed. As with all farms, outbuildings and farming structure were added over time, but the house itself remained very much the same. And I just want to point out to you about the kitchen, because as was the time in those days, kitchens in large houses were usually detached, separate to the main house. And that's because they often had fires in the kitchen. They were high risk and they rather just the kitchen burnt down than the whole house. Again, there were few changes to the house until the mid-1980s. And by to this time, as we said, the Keithleys had moved in permanently. And it was the Keithleys who finally, after around 120 years, decided it was too much going outside to the kitchen and eventually built a conservatory to join up the kitchen to the house. Here's Golden Vale um, front. You can see there's the front veranda. And here's the, the detached kitchen. And it, the kitchen still looks exactly the same today, but um, it's now attached to the house by a conservatory here on this side. This is Golden Vale as it is today. We've still got that magnificent veranda all around the house. You can just see the conservatory at the side here, which joins up with the kitchen. And it's considered an ascetic location within the valley at the foot of Mount Gingham Woman, a rare example of stone and timber buildings in a pleasant setting. But Mrs. Keithley described her time at Golden Vale as living an Edwardian lifestyle. Now, I'm never quite sure what that meant, but she certainly meant limited technology. There was plenty of entertaining, horse riding, music, animals, extensive travel, and fine surroundings. The only toilet on the ground floor was, you still had to go outside, was the end of the courtyard. So some things were quite primitive there, but she had the immortal lifestyle. And there was a certain hauteur about that lifestyle that required dressing for dinner and riding for hounds. That's Geoffrey at a Christmas dinner in 1987. You can see what a fine spread at the table and um, pictures on the wall. And every meal from breakfast through the day was so formal. And you got your napkin in the morning and you kept the same napkin through the day, through to the meals through the day. And also the Sydney Hunt, that's the, the Hunt there in 1996. I, I don't know what they would have been chasing then, foxes or hares or rabbits, I, I just don't know. But they met there three or four times a year. I just also want to say a little bit about the gardens. But this is a very early picture. It's very grain, but you can, you can see the outline of the house, the mountain over at the back here, and this splendid veranda all the way around steps down directly onto the paddock. And the only garden is this picket fence garden here on the south side of the house, but a very, very tiny garden. And it stayed like that for a long, long time. In fact, almost for about 70 years. The next change to the garden was when to Sir Philip Goldfinch. He bought it in 1938. He installed a fenced garden at the front of the property. Uh, this picture is from the Goldfinch album. And again, you can see nothing at the front of the property. You still step down from the veranda onto the paddock. He enclosed the garden at the front. So he had the picket fence removed at the side of the house and 
put this big sort of fence, uh, fence all the way around, which is about one and a half acres, right at the front of the house. And slowly the garden became developed. In fact, the rough paddock slowly became bone grass, it became lawn. And the final phase of the garden is the Keithley Gardens from 1985 to 2015. The garden slowly evolved over the past 30 years. I think in uh, gardening terms, it's not historically significant, but it's very, very pleasant. Under Karen's guidance, the garden was transformed into an English style enclosed garden. Changed from the big open garden of the past 150 years to a very sheltered, rich, horticultural and decorative garden that exists today. The plants are deciduous trees and shrubs. Um, there's a load of springtime bulbs there. Another point of interest about the garden is that uh, the Keithleys had a collection of parrots in aviaries. They may still be there. There were always peacocks wandering around. And there was a, a gaggle of Indian rudder ducks all charging around the garden. And high stone walls protected part of the garden from the weather. I think we can say about the garden today is that it's always had a significant influence on the character of the house. Prior to the 80s, for me, the house always stood proud and exposed and seen as the dominant feature of the landscape. Today, the homestead's very heavily framed and largely concealed by trees and shrubs and almost as if after 160 years, it's turned its back on this wonderful landscape around it. Right at the front of the house, at the end of the garden, they built this um, Italian-looking loggia and a swimming pool. Now, the swimming pool has been filled in now because of safe, health and safety, and it's a reflection pool. It's a very, very pleasant garden to walk around. The house itself hasn't changed much. Physically, the house is much like Edward Carter built it. The significant thing to me is how it's turned its back on the landscape.